Hey everyone and welcome back to another Warcraft lore video. Today, I think you're really in for a treat. After hours of research, I think I've pretty much got Sylvanas sorted and I think you're really going to enjoy today's video. So today, we're going to cover Sylvanas' actions and motivations, past and present. We're going to establish her emotional makeup, her decision-making patterns, her character developments throughout all of the lore and establish her plan going into battle for Azeroth, including when she decided to serve death. What that could actually mean, and when she set off on the path seen throughout Battle for Azeroth. Then in the next episode of our Sylvanas special, we'll go deep into her Battle for Azeroth actions now that we've got full context and a little bit of her future plan. This is a big one, so strap in. Let's dive straight into Warcraft 3's free will version of Sylvanas right after she escaped from the Lich King. Now, her main motivation was the destruction of the Lich King, with her just hating that he had robbed her old life from her, and the free will that he took from those that he claimed. This was her entire drive as a character, and fueled by this, she was able to establish the Forsaken as a true people, even expelling the Dreadlords through a pact with Varamathras, one of course that will come up later. Now, as she secured her holdings, she also knew that she needed to be part of a broader group if her people were to have any hope in the future. The Horde actually replied to her message, with Karn Bloodhoof actually advocating for her. Now, that's something that does make her later actions against Bane, well, sting a little bit more. Now, during World of Warcraft, the Burning Crew said her goal was still to strengthen her people. That goal remained intact, but it was made clear that she had not forgotten her past, as she actually helped the Blood Elves join the Horde, even committing troops to their defense, and also having a rather emotional moment when she was presented with a necklace given to her by her elder sister. And in seeing her mourn the loss of her sister and of her people, we do see that glimmer of emotion, one, of course, that she does try to hold back. And throughout this time, she still just has that one single purpose, to ready herself for the battle against the Lich King, to kill the Lich King. She orders the creation of the new Blight, and in a story, she is shown to be very excited when she finds out it works on both humans and Forsaken alike. And yes, that was after witnessing trials on living specimens. Now, while she ordered its creation, in reality, the Royal Apothecary Society did the legwork, and when it came to Wrath of the Lich King, she planned to use the new Blight. Now, she cared about Northrend, to the point of threatening to pull her support from the Blood Elves when they weren't really sure if they wanted to go. And that really does just show how single-minded she was in her quest to defeat the Lich King. So, okay, the invasion of Northrend begins, and then, of course, we reach the Wrathgate. Now, this is an extremely, extremely important moving forward, especially because Blizzard have since, and rather controversially, recontextualized some events. So, the story as originally told had Varamathra spark off a rebellion in the Undercity right as Wrathgate happened with Putris unleashing the plague on the combined Alliance and Horde forces over at the Wrathgate itself. Now, it was revealed that he was in league with Varamathras, who was never truly loyal to Sylvanas. So, the Alliance and the Horde invaded the Undercity, defeated Putris and Varamathras, almost killed each other, but were stopped by Jaina, who teleported them all away. Now, Sylvanas claimed that Putris and Varamathras had betrayed her, and many people were suspicious of this, of what had went on, but she was allowed to stay in the Horde. Now, Warcraft Chronicle 3 later expanded on this. It tells us that Putris and Varamathras really did stage a coup, but that Sylvanas was the one who created the plague. It says she was willing to take vengeance at any cost. Now, in Rise of the Lich King, the novel by Christy Golden, she says that the plague had better not fall into the wrong hands, so she clearly is aware that it basically is, well, an extremely powerful weapon. Now, Chronicle makes it clear that uh, many were actually skeptical of her version of events. Really kind casting a lot of, uh, well, a lot of doubt as to her story. Now, this was further added to recently, so Blizzard's response to the backlash against Sylvanas' actions at the start of Battle for Azeroth led to this being said. I've been writing Sylvanas personally since 2006, and this is pretty much the Wrathgate and the Blight and the Forsaken in character. Those were all under Sylvanas' orders. So, this quote, pretty much confirms that the Wrathgate incident was orchestrated by Sylvanas. So, what does this actually mean for her character? Well, taking her motivations at the time into account, we clearly know that, uh, well, she will have known that the Wrathgate showdown was going to happen, that the Alliance and Horde forces were working towards that goal, and she knew it was a good shot at Arthas. So, she just took the shot. She did not care if it meant that everyone present would die. All she cared about was the destruction of Arthas. If the plan worked out, she could just blame Putris 
Cyrus and Varimathras, or I'd speculate she maybe already worked out their plan and used the battle for the Undercity as an opportunity to cleanse her nation of rebels. So, no, at that time, she wasn't completely crazy, she did not uh, serve death or anything, she was just single-minded in her desire to take down Arthas, that's literally all she cared about, screw the consequences. Now, later in the Halls of Reflection, she attempted to kill the Lich King, but she realizes she couldn't win, as Uther warned her, and she's actually saved by Varok Sarfang aboard Ogrim's Hammer. Of course, she would later kill him. Now, later on, the Argent Crusade defeated the Lich King along with players, and Sylvanus was sad that she was not there to see it happen. And with her goal complete, she thought of the life that Arthas had robbed from her, and she flung herself off Ice Crown onto the crystallized blood of Yogg-Saron that lay below, believing that it would destroy her. That did not happen. She saw a vision of Garrosh sacrificing her people in a pointless assault, and then she saw the spirit of Arthas as a frightened, lonely boy. She pretty much shared how he felt, being just struck that this oblivion that they found themselves in was really the pretty much the worst place imaginable. And she actually felt pity for him, and that shows that she was still capable of compassion, even for her greatest enemy. Now, she was utterly terrified of her fate, but she found salvation in the Nine Valkyr, whose leader offered to take her place in the Death Realm in return for the Scourge Valkyr being bound to Sylvanas, something that guaranteed those Valkyr a place in the world. Sylvanas agreed to this, and it marked a new chapter in her life. Now, it really can't be overstated how much of a turning point this is in her character, and this is extremely important moving forward. So, she reflected on her people, now thinking them not as being arrows in her quiver, but as being important resources not to be squandered. It is a cool view, yes, one that does show her readjust adjusting to now having a long-term goal of survival rather than just a short-term goal of vengeance at any cost. Now, at this stage, she is driven by fear of death and, as we'll soon see, insecurity. Now, the time after Wrath of the Lich King saw her strike out against the Gilneans. While doing this, she decided to continue the use of her new blight, even though Garrosh specifically outlawed it. And then, actually, upon seeing Sylvanas raise up New Dead with her new Valkyr, Garrosh was rightly horrified, and he compared her to the Lich King. Her plans, of course, ended up not going that well, leading to a stalemate and her death, with the subsequent resurrection of her costing at some of the Valkyr. So, we see that Sylvanas outwardly here attempted to help the Horde, but it was in a very self-serving manner, so she tried to claim new lands, defeat Alliance armies, and she even went as far as to send envoys to Warlord Zela, and she actually said that she did that to mend broken fences, so she was clearly aware that there were suspicions, but of course, in spite of this, the Horde grew ever more suspicious of her, given the Wrathgate, the continued use of Blight, and the actions that really do draw parallels with the Lich King. So with all this, what can we say about Sylvanas? Well, she claimed she wanted to raise up these new forsaken so they could be a truly viable people for years to come, to have a place in the world. However, as we read in Edge of Night, the short story at the end of Ice Crown, she sees them as a resource not to be squandered, meaning that, yeah, she's just being pragmatic here. She doesn't actually care about them that much. So she clearly is the same old Sylvanas. She's thinking in an emotionally disconnected manner, but she's now working towards a longer term goal and is more driven by fear than she had been in the past. Now, it is possible that she still does have an emotional connection to her people. That is actually suggested in 8.2.5. What I would say is that when you're dealing with her inner monologue, this is how she's rationalizing things to herself, and it's explaining her own thought process, her own, basically, rationalization for why she does what she does. So, in that regard, the way that she explains all of this to herself is ruthless pragmatism, even though when you look at her externally, you do see that there is that ruthless pragmatism, but you also see that there's a lot of rationalization decisions being made. Now, as we move onwards through Mists of Pandaria, a few things happen, but what's most important is that she sides with the rebels, clearly knowing what Garrosh had thought of her and remembering the vision that was shown to her after she jumped of Garrosh pretty much getting a lot of her people killed. Vol'jin counted her on his side, which I think is interesting given where the plot goes, given how they both sort of have a death alignment, and that she is shown to be on, well, less than good terms with Lorthamar, who, of course, we know did actually pursue joining the Alliance at that time, only to have Jaina thwart his plan by, uh, well, you know, what happened in Dalaran. Now, Sylvanas later wanted to raise everyone who died during the Siege of Orgrimmar, but she was forbidden to touch elves by Lorthamar. And this does show that her tactics are what they are, have been what they are, and will just continue to be what they are, making her decisions at Lordaeron really come at no surprise at all, 
even though it obviously is a terrible PR move for her. Now, this is all in line with Sylvanas' motivation to protect her people, even if it is just out of selfish pragmatism, not love. And, well, if it is love, then she's basically rationalizing that away with the cunning, like, pragmatic angle, and that really that love is a source of insecurity. And this is what we see in War Crimes, where she tries to reconnect with Verisa, and she actually tries to convince Verisa to co-lead the Forsaken alongside her. Verisa considers it, but she's actually unaware that Sylvanas actually wanted to poison her, kill her, raise her up, knowing that the Forsaken would not accept a living leader. Now, this is such an important point because we see that Sylvanas still is capable of emotion, that she has emotional needs. She craves an emotional life, but that, well, actually actualizing that turns dark, as her ideal version of that relationship involves Risa being non-consensually killed and raised up as an undead. So as you can see here, Sylvanas absolutely is comfortable acting in a Lich King-like manner, so while, you know, she may have hated him for what he did to her, her personal desires and emotional needs come first. They may even make her betray her principles. Indeed, during the Cataclysm, she did tell Garrosh that what separated her from the Lich King was that she served the Horde. Now, Verisa did turn down Sylvanas' offer, and that wounded Sylvanas emotionally to a great deal, and that likely increased her capacity for cruelty and made it harder for her to open up emotionally, and it really did make her even more insecure. And from here on especially, you see that Sylvanas just has so much emotional baggage that she clearly refuses to deal with. And this does go a long way to explaining her later actions. Now, before we tackle Legion, we've got Dark Mirror. This is a short story wherein Sylvanas grants Nathanos his new hot body. Now, after the transformation, one of Sylvanas's rangers suggests to Nathanos that Sylvanas is actually, like, romantically interested in him. Now, Sylvanas has actually not shown this in-game herself. Nathanos, though, thinking that clearly ended up being entirely trustworthy, entirely obedient. We even see him profess his love to her at the end of the Fourth War. Now, she doesn't reciprocate this in-game, and that actually leads me to suspect that Sylvanas sowed this seed on purpose, you know, actually told her Dark Ranger to say that to Nathanos, and that she's merely using him to further her goals, understanding that, uh, well, the usefulness of one who is wholly loyal is uh, actually quite a lot, or that maybe her initial plan was that, but that, again, she's refusing to deal with her emotions and that that is a, a sort of a thing that she's sort of struggling with there. And really, it just does paint a picture that, yes, yeah, she's trying to say that she's cold and calculating. That's probably the lie that she tries to tell herself internally as well, but that really she might actually have some of those emotional needs. And that would make sense, given the lament of the highborn scene and what she clearly wanted from Verisa. Clearly, a part of her does want a home life and a family here. Anyway, next we've got Legion, the expansion that truly set her on her current path, even though her motivations came long before. Now, Blizzard website teased for her that the stakes had never been higher, as the Legion killing her would leave her eternally damned in the spirit realm she visited after Ice Crown. It teases that she will have to decide how far she'll go to protect her people, and if they are more precious to her than her soul. And I think already we can quite clearly answer that question, because as shown in the Edge of Night short story, she sees her people as a resource. Okay, it's one not to be wasted, but still a resource. Now, she does seem to have a bit of empathy towards their experience, as she says at the end of patch 8.2.5, but even still later on in that cutscene, she does just say that they'll die along with the living, showing that indeed her people are, uh, well, not more important than her goals. Now, this takes us to the Broken Shore, where Sylvanas is involved, and Blizzard show her in a completely heroic light here, doing her best to win, but ultimately refusing to sacrifice the Horde for victory. She later, of course, becomes the war chief upon Vol'jin's request. However, it's now clear that Vol'jin was being impacted by a mysterious force when he actually said that. But for what it's worth, Sylvanas is actually, like, visibly taken aback by Vol'jin's announcement. She goes as close to dropping her jaw in surprise as I think she's capable of, and one just has to wonder if that's the same mysterious, you know, spirit who manipulated Vol'jin, that also maybe uh, manipulated Sylvanas uh, with the, like, Garrosh vision after she fell from Ice Cram. Hard to know, of course. Now, she endeared herself to the Horde people with a noble speech, saying that Vol'jin was dead and asking who will help her avenge him. And that speech worked. The Horde rallied behind her and she ended up being a popular leader. Now, after what we've examined thus far, it's clear that she made that decision knowing that the Broken Shore was pretty much always a losing fight and that the Horde's sacrifice there would not have been useful to her. As established in Edge of Night, this is merely pragmatism. She views the people as a resource not to be wasted 
wasted. It's not really out of genuine love. Later, though, she then travels to Stormheim, aiming to force Aeir to create more Valkyr for her. Why? Well, those Valkyr are the key to Sylvanas's personal survival, and clearly that of her people. So, having more Valkyr for her is a very pragmatic move. It's extremely important. Now, to further this aim, she enters a pact with Helia, from which she gains the Soul Cage, an item that would let her actually subdue Aeir and pretty much forcibly create new Valkyr. But this plan is stopped just before fruition by a vengeful Gen Greymane determined to rob Sylvanas of her future, just as she had done to his son. Sylvanas is enraged, and she resolves to pursue getting more Valkyr by any means. Now, this is important. This is a major fork in the road for Sylvanas. Had her goal have been achieved here, then she would have known that her people and uh, her own future was secure right? She would have been fine. Remember all that we've established thus far in this video. Sylvanas is terrified of what will happen to her when she dies. The Valkyr are her only insurance policy. She views her people as a resource not to be wasted. Her best shot at not dying is, uh, well, having a large supply of people. She is now desperate, and when she gets desperate, that's when she will act in a more emotionally driven, reckless manner as her, well, as sometimes her, you know, insecurities come up, but then also as, like, like seen in the Wrathgate, when she's desperate, when she only has one goal, well, in that case, people are merely just arrows for her quiver. Now, with these stakes established, as well as how Sylvanas will react to them, we've got to wonder at this stage, what is her plan? So we know that there's a pact with Helia, but we do not know its scope. It's also possible that uh, some details are missing from Sylvanas' post, uh, like post Ice Crown Jump visions. It's also possible that she knows much of the Shadowlands, given her pact with the Valkyr, and uh, that knowing the Soul Cage was lost to her, she decided that she had to walk a darker path, that it was the only other thing she could do. We must then work out, does she serve a death entity, or has she decided to become the master of death. After all, what way to, uh, you know, what's a better way to, like, not ever die than to master death itself? With Legion finished, we then move on to the Three Sisters comic, where she reconnects with Verisa and Illyria. Now, it's clear that Sylvanas is still wounded by Verisa's rejection, with Sylvanas actually blaming Warlords of Draenor and Legion's events on Verisa, as she basically chickened out of assassinating Garrosh. And this, again, just goes to show the potential effectiveness for putting aside morals for pragmatism, because, in this case, Sylvanas is right. If Garrosh had have been quickly killed, the Legion would not have been able to access Azeroth through their pact with Gul'dan. So, yeah, Sylvanas kind of had a point. Now, Illyria is constantly, throughout this entire time, hearing these Void Whispers, and the Void Whispers are saying that Sylvanas serves the true enemy, that she serves death. Now, it's said in uh, Chronicle that death is resistant to Void, and uh, Illyria herself later actually confirms this in patch 8.2.5, where she says that Sylvanas' army would be very strong against Nazoth. Now, given all the context that we have now, I think this comic makes Sylvanas' turning point very clear indeed. It kind of confirms it. So she had these Dark Rangers ready to kill her sisters, with the plan being to raise them up in her service. Now, her planning this, combined with her later actions, shows that by this point in the story, she serves death in the same capacity that she is shown to in patch 8.2.5, making it highly likely that Illyria's Void Whispers are correct. Now, sure, you might not trust the Void Whispers, but here's the thing. We're told that the Void sees all possible truths, but that cannot necessarily tell which ones are actually correct. Well, in this case, it seems like the Void is talking about the version of Sylvanas that actually did come to pass. So, does she serve death, an entity, or does she serve the force of death, aiming to be a master of it? Really, at this stage, it could go either way. Now, Verisa decided to apologize for what she did earlier, and this was genuinely impactful for Sylvanas. It briefly, I would say, snapped her out of it, leading to her not giving the kill order, though she does glow that they eventually will serve her. Anyway, the sisters depart, and later on, with the war against Legion being finished, Sylvanas has rallied the people of the Horde, and at the beginning of Before the Storm, it's clear that she is a decently popular leader, but that she has grown frustrated with her position as war chief, finding it so somewhat restricting because of its visibility, and she's also annoyed by the Desolate Council, who are a group who are threatening her tight grip on the Undercity. Sylvanas resolves to let the Horde rest, but she knew that war was inevitable, and she thus resolves to strike first against Stormwind, destroying the city and raising its inhabitants. And I then assume she would clean, you know, clean out the, uh, the dwarves and the gnomes. After all, she couldn't have her lands be divided by enemies. Now, given how she considers the humans to be 
a threat and how she is so worried about the loss of her Valkyr. This goal makes, uh, well, pragmatic sense in the context of self-preservation, at least from her point of view. By this stage, it's clear that she does not want to just defeat her enemies. Indeed, by this stage, she wishes to feed death, or as she calls it later, the hungering darkness. Now, whether that is serving death an entity or working to master the force of death, uh, you know, you just can't tell right now. A Sylvanas, who has power of the Shadowlands, though, will never be left in that cold, dark, lonely place that horrified her soul years ago. I mean, really think about it. With so many of her Valkyr dead, what option does she have? You might say she could trust her kin, her allies, but remember how emotionally wounded she is. Most of her family was massacred before the Third War. She was tormented by Arthas. She was left suicidal after the Lich King's death, only to then have seemingly a glimpse of the most horrifying fate imaginable. She has long mourned the loss of her old life, only to have the chance to reconnect with it, but then only to have Verisa reject her. Now, combine all of this with the Horde having been suspicious of her for years, and you can see how she's just nigh incapable of trust. So, a villain? Yes. A tragic one? Well, examining the lore? Yes. But what's important, I think, here is that a lot of this has not been told in-game, and that means that Sylvanas' motivations will not make sense to many. So, with all of this covered, join me in the next episode of the Sylvanas Deep Dive, where I am going to go deep into Battle for Azeroth's lore, and we're going to figure out what is next for her. We're going to chart where she basically starts off emotionally in the expansion, and the twists and turns, and what they do, how they actually change her decision-making, and, well, the key inflection points that are going to lead to, uh, I would imagine, a future expansion, at least something major, where she is a driving force. Anyway, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I loved writing it, and with that, I will see you next time.